All right, everyone, it's 12.02 here in Calgary, so we're going to start our session. Uh, welcome to the Canada West Foundation Arthur J.E. Child Pop-Up Policy Session. Canada West Foundation has been hosting these pop-up policy sessions for the last couple of years, basically on interesting topics with interesting people. That's our goal. And we're trying to have discussions around topics that in a way that maybe they haven't gotten attention in the same way before. Canada West Foundation, for those of you who don't know us, is a nonprofit independent think tank. And really we're the only ones that eat, live, breathe and, and, and sing the West in Canada. CWF is also a participant in the Intergovernmental Fiscal Relations Commission. Um, there's a link on our website. Jamie, I think, is going to put the link in the chat. This commission is just getting underway. So this Intergovernmental Fiscal Relations Commission is dealing with the kinds of topics that we're talking about today. A um, little bit of advertising. We've got a, a short brief on Canada Health Transfer Backgrounder and one of our participants today, Dr. Trevor Toome from the University of Calgary, has a what now on the need to review Canada's fiscal stabilization program, which is just one piece of many uh, elements of Canada's fiscal relations. The um, chat and Q&A uh, functions are enabled. I'm not sure we're going to get to your questions today. We have some uh, a lot to get through and we've got only 60 minutes, but do please send them in and uh, they won't go unnoticed, I can tell you that. Today's discussion we've entitled The Art of Sharing, Fiscal Relations in the Federation. I wish I could take credit for the title, but I must give credit where credit's due. Mary Janigan is the author of a recent book by that title. And um, if you're interest, further, more interested, the link to the book was a, a, on the invitation that you received. The reason we invited Mary to join us is we're, we're trying to take a different perspective with this session today. So we have Professor Toome, who is an expert on all things fiscal federalism. He's, he's, he's the king of graphs and charts. Um, so he comes from an econ economist perspective, although he's done a lot of work on, the, on how programs have evolved. Mary's perspective as a journalist and a historian gives her that sense of how we got here and maybe how we can move forward. We also have three other panelists today. Uh, Kevin Doherty, who's a former finance minister in the province of Saskatchewan. So we have lived experience as well as experts. We also have Suzanne, Suzanne Anton, who was an attorney general of British Columbia. Both Suzanne and Kevin are board members of the Canada West Foundation. We also have another board member, Diane Gray. Diane Gray is currently the CEO of Centreport uh, in Winnipeg, but Diane also has a, a previous life experience as a um, senior official in intergovernmental affairs during some interesting times in Canada and she was in the province of Manitoba. So what we've got here is a real broad perspective on how sharing works or doesn't work in this country, what our objectives are for sharing. Um, I enjoyed uh, Mary's book. Um, I won't give you a full pricey, uh, the staff at Canada West Foundation are tired of hearing me say, oh, this was so interesting. Um, but you know, Canada has a long history of sharing, as do many other federations. I didn't realize what the Atlantic provinces gave up in terms of revenue when they joined Confederation. And there was a pretty interesting negotiation happening when that all happened. Then we had Western provinces negotiating the rights both to control and receive resource re royalty revenue. And then in the 1982 Constitution, that resource control was entrenched in the Constitution and equalization as a principle was also entrenched in the Constitution. So in a sense, something that we almost, I don't know if we take it for granted in Canada today, but it wasn't until 1982 that that became a real principle of federalism. In Alberta, we might be talking more about that in a referendum in the fall, um, but, 
as part of another uh, activity of the Canada West Foundation, we're part of the Confederation of Tomorrow Initiative. And we had, we've done several national surveys. And interestingly, we, when we asked questions about equalization, we found out two things. We found out that the support for equalization across the country is generally high. Even in Alberta, it's over 50%. But at the same time, people actually don't know a lot about it. And so most Canadians don't know whether their province receives equalization or not. Uh, either they're wrong or they say, they admit, I don't know. So it's conversations like we're having today that hopefully will stir Canadians to think about something that's really fundamental to our, to our federation. So let's get started. I'm gonna ask Kevin, uh, the bios for all of our wonderful panelists are on the invitation. So I'm sure you've read them all. I think the, the uh, when I looked at the list of reg registrants, I'm thinking this is a group of people that does their homework. I mean, there's a, you know, there's kind of a standing joke in our office that there's only 12 people in Canada that actually understand equalization. And all 12 of them, I think, are on this call. So, and then a whole, a whole lot more who understand at least some piece of the issue or with respect to uh, established programs, financing or whatever. But it's clearly something that I think a lot of Canadians want to understand better, including myself. And so I'm really pleased that everyone has uh, agreed to join us today. So I'm gonna ask Kevin to, to or sorry, I'm gonna ask Diane to kick off with the first question today. Diane? Great, thanks Colleen and hello everyone. Um, a, a topic that we've talked about in Canada for a long time on the intergovernmental and the intergovernmental finance front is the fiscal imbalance. Um, obviously, it, it, Colleen referenced equalization, which is the horizontal imbalance, but my question is about the vertical imbalance. Um, a fiscal imbalance on the vertical side is essentially a monetary imbalance between the federal and provincial governments. And so Mary, in your opinion, has the pandemic exacerbated the imbalance? And what are your projections regarding the imbalance in a post-pandemic period? Do you think things are going to be aggravated by the increased risk and spending pressures on provinces? Um, or do you think that the government of Canada's spending during the pandemic is going to help provinces recover more quickly? First of all, I'd like to thank Colleen and the Canada West Foundation for having me. It's a huge honor. Secondly, I think what's extraordinary is how this panel has been set up, which is looking basically at how the Intergovernmental Fiscal Relations Commission. What I noticed over the years is that equalization is a very important principle for a federation. I know you're asking about vertical imbalance, but you know it's a principle. The formulas change all the time. Colleen referenced EPF, which changed its name in the 90s. All of these programs have changed and changed some more. And I think, I, I believe an expert, an economist like Trevor could be stronger on this, but it seems to me that the provinces are going to be in deeper trouble after the pandemic. And therefore, using the federal redistributive function, in other words, being able to have a federal government that is stronger in revenues and uh, in revenues than the other provinces is than the provinces I beg your pardon is going to be important as we move into post pandemic eras the commission the group that you've set up should look at this in all federations or in most of them the central government always has more revenues precisely for this reason, to be able to redistribute, to create a sense of national standards, to try and give a pan-Canadian view to things. But you know, if the pragmatic formulas are not working, 
these efforts are lost. I think things like this commission has to look at the formulas used to redistribute and go into another era. After all, we changed in the first decade of the 21st century, moving to per capita amounts for healthcare and social services as opposed to the way we were paying them before. You can change things. It's not written stone. So if it's judged that the provinces are lacking in vital revenues and they're chafing at depending on Ottawa, this should be discussed at the commission and new ideas brought up. It's, it's, to, me, it's to me the only way to keep the Federation alive and functioning is to keep looking at it. May I add one thing? In 2019, Ottawa had the perfect opportunity to discuss equalization and therefore the provinces would have raised other issues with the provinces. The formula was up for renewal. Instead, in 2018, Ottawa simply renewed the formula automatically. It was under no obligation to discuss the issue. But my goodness, it should have tried. The Liberals thought they were being smart because it was going to be an election year. So why have this issue coming up? Why have this squabbling? But here we are with the possibility of a referendum in Alberta with other malcontent governments. And you know, it would be a good idea to keep looking at these issues. I, I think, this commission is a good start. Trevor, did you want to add anything on the post-pandemic uh, situation that we're going to be facing with respect to both federal and provincial uh, revenue capacity? Yeah, I, I would like to add just uh, a couple brief comments here related to this question of where does the vertical imbalance in Canada go? So just taking a step back, quick background for participants, that vertical imbalance is just a, a jargony wonky way to say there's a misalignment between revenue raising capabilities and expenditure responsibilities of different orders of government, federal versus provincial. And provinces, because they are responsible for healthcare delivery in Canada, are the ones that are facing uh, the prospect of very rapidly rising healthcare costs from an aging population, potentially quite significant increases in healthcare spending in the coming years, where the federal government's exposure to increasing expenditure demands from an aging population is much, much less. And so in that sense, this vertical imbalance may uh, be increasing in the coming years. That's not something that is exacerbated by the pandemic directly, but what the pandemic has done is eaten into some of the fiscal room that provinces had. Uh, we've seen that rising spending by provincial governments through the pandemic, a lot of it has been absorbed and cushioned by the feds uh, through various ad hoc transfer arrangements that they've rolled out in 2020, but provinces are seeing revenue declines through 2020 from uh, economic contractions, lower business profits, lower incomes from lower employment, and so on. So provincial debt levels will be rising pretty, or have risen pretty significantly through uh, the pandemic. And that kind of shrinks the runway that they had to the extent that they had any prior to uh, the pandemic. So thinking about demographics and the real fiscal challenges there, it's a slower moving challenge for sure, but it's bigger than COVID. And COVID has kind of amplified the importance of thinking about how we're going to better incorporate these kind of big issues like demographics into our transfer arrangements. Because right now, uh, they're just not well suited to handle those pressures. Anybody else want to chime in on that? Suzanne, I'm going to pass it over to you as an attorney general. You're, you're keenly aware of these jurisdictional responsibilities as assigned through the Constitution. Yes, Mary, I'm very interested in your thesis, which is that this, the um, things like equalization are the ties that bind us. But I'm also very interested in the constitutional relationships. We are we are supposedly sovereign in our, our own obligations. And so the provinces are sovereign on the 
provincial authorities and the federal government is sovereign on its. Now that, um, I, <laughs> given a lot of time, I would talk about the carbon tax case and how that has shaken that notion to the core, but um, I won't go there right at the moment. I'll, I'd just like to talk about one of the issues which is very live at the moment, which is the uh, childcare. So when you're in government, I was, I've been a local politician in the city of Vancouver, and I was, of course, a member of the provincial cabinet. You get a lot of calling, we need more childcare, we need more childcare, which we always do. And I totally, I, this is not a childcare discussion, this is more of a constitutional discussion. So people say, well, we have to have a national strategy. We need a national strategy on housing. We need a national strategy on seniors. We need a national strategy on childcare. So now we've got $30 billion um, allocated to a national strategy on childcare over the next five years. And using, again, the pandemic as, as a reason to do it, um, it immediately comes with a secretariat and all kinds of bureaucratic expenses. Uh, but, it's, but it is fundamentally a provincial matter. Um, and the provinces and the cities and most in, in across the country manage it. So how do the how do things like an, a new national strategy on child care, how does that impact your thesis that these are the ties that bind us? And Trevor, I'd be interested in your comments as well on the constitutionality and how these things actually do play out when it's fundamentally a provincial responsibility. Should should I start? Um, and I first of all, it's very difficult. Uh, to keep the feds at bay during the <laughs> when the provinces are struggling financially. But two things, number one, uh, there was, I think in the late, in 1999, the social union framework agreement was passed in Ottawa. Under that, Ottawa pledged not to introduce any new social programs unless a majority of the provinces agreed. Probably a majority of the provinces will agree to this because many of the provinces are poor and don't have the cash. Uh, number one. Number two, I think that we have kind of gotten along before on new social programs. And I think we can get along on this one. But as, but I can understand provincial resentment at the need to keep creating new social programs using the federal spending power, which is constitutionally permitted. I mean, it's been okayed by courts forever. They do have the right to spend wherever they want. I think that in this pre-election time, they are going to have to walk very carefully to ensure they get the required majorities to even proceed. Now, um, do we want this program? Each province is going to ha have to ask that question. And if a majority don't agree, it won't go ahead. This at least is some curb on the federal spending power. It was going to be curbed in Beach Lake and in the Charlottetown Accord, but those went down to defeat. So constitutionally, except for this social union framework agreement, uh, they could proceed, although I don't see how they could do it, frankly. It does require provincial buy-in like Medicare, like hospital care before that. Trevor. So when I think about the question of what the appropriate role of the federal government is in different social programs, different areas like that, I, I, I tend to think about why we are decentralized as a country to begin with. There are a lot of advantages from having a decentralized approach to delivering public services, it allows for experimentation, it allows for uh, tailoring public services to local preferences and needs and circumstances. And so in that sense, having provinces deliver most of our public services is a deliberate choice made by um, framers throughout Canadian history. And there's a, a lot of merit to that. I think 
where the federal government plays a role is, is in areas where there are spillover effects across provinces, either, um, for example, during the pandemic. It's entirely appropriate for the federal government to have an important role to be played in terms of pandemic responses, uh, the vaccine procurement and uh, R&D issues, things like, things like that. But also uh, in terms of maybe migration. So I think about old age security, uh, guaranteed income supplements, for example, people do move and retire in, in locations where they do not work in. And so in a sense, there's a stronger case potentially for the federal government to be uh, involved in, in that area. And then as an expediency, the federal government is just better able to absorb big shocks. And so this is why federal uh, it, this is why the federal government is involved in EI. They, they weren't historically, but the Great Depression showed that provinces were just in, in really extreme moments not able to carry that uh, burden as easily as the federal government could. So we shifted it up to the federal level. So when I think about the, the newer areas that the feds have signaled interest in, things like childcare, long-term care, I'm not sure I see the same case there that one uh, could make for things like uh, EI and old age security. So I guess I would approach this more as it, provinces ought to just have, or we ought to think about whether provinces have the fiscal capacity to, if they so choose, deliver these services or, or not. Uh, rather than the federal government involving itself directly in these kind of programs. I think the devil's in the details, and we don't yet know exactly what the feds uh, actually have in mind here. Maybe they do just want to cut checks and then claim some of the credit for programs that are, mm -hmm. that are either currently existing or might be rolled out anyway. Uh, but that's kind of, those are the dimensions that I look at. Are there spillovers? Can, are there large tail risks that the federal government can better absorb than provinces. And if not, then um, I tend to think that provinces are the more appropriate order of government. I, I guess I'd also throw in the piece that I mentioned about the, the bureaucracy involved. You know, you, we've got bureaucracy in the city. City of Vancouver has got a big bureaucracy. I, I'm, not, I don't, I'm not saying that in a disparaging way. They do a very good job in terms of providing childcare in Vancouver. You know, the provincial government's got an, another big group of people looking out for childcare. Now we're going to have another huge group and the federal government looking out for it. it it's, it's not a single service now like the um, employment insurance. It's a, it's a three government proposition and, and it's, you know, it's very costly to taxpayers. I totally buy and agree that we should have available childcare. I've got a number of grandchildren right now and with parents looking for good childcare. So that, this is not anything to do with that proposition, but it's to do with the federal involvement in it. But don't forget, the feds would have to, I assume, sign deals with each province so that funding can be transferred. And traditionally, this would be non-conditional funding, or it should be under the, under the general approach the feds have taken. I'm assuming that this could work as a national program. But I also like the fact that it's up to the individual provinces and there has to be a majority to sign on. The days are gone when the feds could just say, yes, this is what's going to happen and this is how it'll be. Kevin, I'll ask you to put your finance minister hat on. You sat at these negotiating tables on these programs. What are your thoughts? Well, I wish those funds from the feds came with, with no conditions attached. I recall vividly sitting at the Fed Prov Territorial Finance Ministers and, and Health Ministers table brought together in, I think it was 2017, where the federal government of the day, uh, Mr. Morneau was the finance minister and, and Dr. Philpott was the health federal health minister. And they had additional dollars they wanted to provide to the provinces uh, through the Canada Health Social Transfer. And all the finance ministers and health ministers were summoned to Ottawa uh, sitting in the Chateau Laurier ballroom, trying to understand the numbers that the feds had put up on a screen and refused to even uh, circulate paper to the individual delegations to say, here's what we're looking at with respect to dollars to your province. And Dr. Philpot being very specific and telling the, the ministers provincially, here's additional dollars for your province in healthcare, but here's what you're going to spend it on. And here's the measurements you're going to measure. And here's the reports you're going to give back to the federal government as to what you did with that money. And I remember at one time, 
telling tales out of school here, going up to, to Bill Morneau, and who I got along with very well and quite liked. And I just said, Bill, stop treating us like we're at the kids' table at the Christmas dinner here. I mean, we're trying to find dollars to provide programs in our respective provinces to deliver health care. And all due respect to Dr. Philpot, I'm sure she's a terrific physician, but she's from downtown Toronto and doesn't know the needs of the province of Saskatchewan with respect to what we need to spend additional health care dollars on. And maybe it's long-term care, but maybe we have more of a problem on surgical wait lists in the province of Saskatchewan, or maybe we have more of an addictions problem, or maybe we have more of a acute care problem that we need immediate dollars for. So we appreciate the money, but you can't take this one size fits all attitude because you campaigned on it as you're gonna do something in long-term care when that might not be a problem in my province or Suzanne's province or Diane's province. So that was one example um, we were very frustrated. So to a T, the ministers, the, the, the provincial ministers said, no thanks, and walked away, had the closing news conferences. And I was literally in the taxi on the way to the airport in Ottawa when Morneau called me and said, okay, we need to talk. And he was doing that with the individual provinces, trying to understand their individual needs and how to tailor these, these dollars. So, you know, I, I think my biggest frustration, whether it's national programs like equalization or these the Canada health and social transfer is, is the lack of flexibility. And uh, one of the areas that I've always been concerned with is that uh, priorities go up and down in respect of provinces, given the economic circumstances and, and issues that they have to deal with. And we need to find a way to be more flexible in addressing those issues as they arise, whether it's a massive forest fire or flood or some type of natural disaster or economically with respect to the, you know, the resource producing provinces going through those issues with respect to a commodity cycle crash. So um, that's been a frustration of mine. Just one example of this federal provincial conditional funding coming from the federal government. Kevin, I'm gonna ask you to continue. You had a question around equalization. Well, I did, I, it goes back to what I was just talking about. So, you know, my time in cabinet in Saskatchewan under Premier Wall, um, Saskatchewan is a resource producing province, um, heavily relied on resource revenue, non-renewable resource revenues. And we saw as a percentage of our revenues in our budget drop from about 22, 23% revenues on non-renewable non resource revenues to below 10% in the matter of a couple of years. So that's a significant drop in revenues that you need to deal with as a policymaker in trying to devise a budget, still having to maintain a level of services to your citizens that they expect so you have a few choices. Um, you know, you can raise taxes, you can cut expenditures, or you can borrow on the capital markets for operating purposes, which I don't recommend uh, on a, on a long-term sustainable basis, or a combination thereof. And I, I guess my question is, it goes back to the, the lack of flexibility on these formulaic policies that when provinces, and I, and I would argue that perhaps Newfoundland, Labrador, and Alberta probably got hit even harder um, with respect to the holes in their budget and if this becomes a long-term sustained downturn uh, with these commodities, then you have a structural deficit. And I think we're seeing that now in a lot of cases with some of these provinces. So these structural deficits can lead to unsustainable debt levels that, that provinces will have a very difficult time pulling themselves out of over a long period of time. So I guess I would just appreciate your thoughts on the lack of flexibility in these formulaic national programs to address these, uh, these issues? I think there's a very hard reckoning coming with equalization. Uh, the person who's written very well about alternatives for the other provinces that are non-recipient is Trevor, who's looked at the fiscal stabilization program, which is supposed to be an insurance policy for revenue drops. It's not working very well. It wasn't sufficiently funded. It got more funds in November, uh, I'm sorry, I believe it was 2020. More money was added to the pot. But the program itself is supposed to be a match with equalization. Equalization to the, the, the ones who have provinces which have a lower fiscal capacity stabilization for those who suffer from abrupt revenue drops. As you know, 50% uh, drop in revenues, uh, 5%, I'm sorry, 50% natural resources, 5% in revenues. 
what I don't understand still to this moment is why, and I hate to sound like a broken record, why the Liberals did not sit down with the provinces in 2018 and start to look at where these formulas were taking us. I think, Trevor, I may be mistaken, but you have looked at linking uh, stabilization to GDP, which would be, it seems to me, a more sensible way to approach it than looking at simply revenue drop. I, I can't agree more with you. These, these programs as they now exist are not working. There has to be a way to fix them. And I am surprised the feds have not looked at this themselves. Perhaps they are. But meanwhile, what is taking place in terms of the Intergovernmental Fiscal Relations Commission is a good start. It has to change. Otherwise, you know, these stresses build up in federations. And if you don't respond to them, if you don't look at them more sensibly, I like your story of Morno calling you. Did those, my question is, did those uh, conditions still remain on the extra health care transfers? We were through Minister Morneau's interventions, we were able to negotiate uh, loosen parameters, shall we say, and using those dollars for what our immediate needs were in Saskatchewan. I can't speak for the other provinces, but uh, Morneau was a, was a very good negotiator and, and very uh, sensitive to the regional issues that he had to deal with as a finance minister. Of course, he has a boss and he has a cabinet that he has to report to as well. So I understand that dynamic and having a premier and colleagues in the cabinet, you have to convince as well. But uh, I found great flexibility with him um, personally, but not so much uh, on some other issues. The whole CPP negotiation, I could write a book about, but I'll leave that for another time. <laughs> Thank you. Trevor? Do you want to add anything, Trevor? Yeah, on this distinction between stabilization and equalization, I think that that's critically important to keep in mind here. We should always be asking, what is the problem that these programs are trying to overcome? Uh, when I look at Alberta's uh, fiscal challenges and its deficit, I don't see a role for the federal government to help us bridge that gap between revenue and spending. We made some choices around how to raise revenues and how to allocate them across different program spending areas, and those choices involved significant risk exposure to adverse commodity price movements. And so that's what we have seen. And we just need to make some choices as Albertans around how we fund public services, at what level, um, should we make up for disappointingly low levels of natural resources through other sources of revenues, higher taxes or new taxes, or through lower spending in, in different areas. So I think Alberta um, is entirely responsible for and capable of overcoming its fiscal challenges. But stabilization is, is a program where its value to Alberta is not in helping address our structural deficit, but it is in helping us more efficiently absorb a big shock. Like federal debt is just cheaper than provincial debt. And, and public debt is uh, appropriate to be used to smooth out shocks increasing it during bad times and um, ideally repaying it in good times that follow. And so stabilization is kind of meant for the feds to use its borrowing instead of uh, provincial debt. But uh, the way the program was structured prior to 2020 is just so insignificant that it barely exists in any meaningful sense. Even after the expansion in 2020, it's still relatively modest. And so thinking about ways of expanding an insurance program like that um, in a way that actually does just cushion the exogenous shock to a province rather than subsidizing particular choices that provinces make. I think there's huge value in that going forward. Uh, equalization, it's about these persistent gaps in strengths of economic activity across provinces. If I look at the Maritimes or if I look at Newfoundland, they're in a very different situation then Alberta, the Maritimes just have weaker economies, lower levels of income. It's harder to fund public services there. Whereas Alberta, despite the shock, despite 2020, is still either in the number one position or very close uh, to it, even post COVID. And so equalization is not 
meant to support high income provinces. It's meant to support the low income ones. Am I right that you would uh, link stabilization to GDP? Yeah, and I would link, link equalization to GDP as well. I mean, these questions around how we can design a formula that doesn't uh, introduce what insurance arrangements always need to tackle, things like moral hazard, where if you're covering the, uh, the consequences of a decision, then you're increasing the incentive to potentially engage in risky activity. And this is a challenge for any insurance arrangement, stabilization too. So I think about... What's something that is very highly correlated to the fiscal pressures the provinces face, yet something that is very, very hard for them to directly influence and control, and that is GDP. And this kind of uh, macro formula to stabilization would, I think, be um, the type of insurance that would not be exposed to moral hazard, and so the feds could feel more confident in expanding the size of stabilization without introducing uh, or without exposing the federal government to risks of provincial policy choices. Um, I would also uh, look at equalization and use a macro formula there too, so that we could abstract from all of the sometimes very contentious design details, um, uh, you know, around like resource revenue inclusion rates and things like that. So going forward then on equalization and stabilization, Trevor, what are, you know, you've given us some thoughts and certainly the Intergovernmental Fiscal Relations Commission, and I apologize for the length of the title. <laughs> if anybody has a suggestion for a shorter title, please send it on. Um, you know, going forward, how are we actually going to get this ball rolling? So this is a question I actually wanted to, to pose to Mary, because support for and, and opposition to programs like equalization, you know, it rises and falls and in different locations at different times. Actually, in, in your book, The Art of Sharing, I found it uh, interesting to note that it was the Edmonton Chamber of Commerce that was way back, one of the early proponents of a program like equalization. So, so circumstances change. And right now in Alberta, or even in Newfoundland and Labrador in their last election, we're seeing increased attention and um, in many cases, rising opposition to equalization. So what can our historical experience around debates uh, around programs like equalization, how can that inform how we should best approach these debates today in a productive way? What I found interesting when I started was I did not understand how far back how grievously quarrels between the richer and the poorer provinces almost brought Canada to the brink so many times. And what saved us, even from pre-Confederation days, was the willingness to make adjustments, to move around the edges, to, to change things so that provinces quietly got a better deal. The book points out that it was sacred to keep saying all provinces were equal. It had to be all provinces were equal. There was no idea of equity coming into the arrangement that there had to be some recognition of richer and poorer. So even before Confederation, the federal negotiators found a way to quietly, surreptitiously increase the subsidies for the poorer provinces without admitting that they needed the money. And when we lurched on through the 20th century, always, always with a willingness somehow, whether dragged, kicking and screaming or deciding it was time, the partners made agreements. They came to a way of fixing things. And the lesson was obvious to me. You had to admit there was inequity. You had to admit that we had to find a way to address it. And you had to be aware of the ways that different provinces were handling their affairs. What, what became incredible in the 1950s was the tax rental deals in the post-war era, era were objectionable to Quebec. So Quebec wouldn't participate in these deals. It wouldn't allow Ottawa to collect its pivotal taxes 
and it lost out on compensatory grants that really affected its revenue raising. And I was very impressed with Louis Saint Laurent during this. I, going through all the documents that I could pull, at every point, Louis Saint Laurent went against his finance ministry officials. He always, always found another way to, he was the one who really saw equalization, who saw with that they could take the compensatory grant portion of the payments under the tax rental agreements and give it to all poorer provinces. And you know, I covered Ottawa. And I look back now and I think, sometimes I really bought into the federal line. I, I couldn't shake it. I couldn't see another way of seeing things. And of course you get briefed surreptitiously by officials from different ministries. Saint broke that. And he obviously did it at risk to himself. It upset Ontario, it upset the Maritimes, but he saw a different way. And the lesson of history is twofold. Number one, you have to be willing to talk and to change things. And number two, if you don't, if you don't find a way to keep rearranging these approaches, you're going to have secession or dangerous talk of secession. I really worry that if there is a referendum in Alberta, uh, the facts will be twisted and the principle will be confused with the problems with the way formulae in federal transfers work. I, it's so easy for misinformed people to keep using the words Alberta is transferring. I, I wish that your Intergovernmental Fiscal Relations Commission could work very fast. And I wish that there was a greater willingness to negotiate around equalization, but around all these federal transfers. Personally, just to add an opinion, I wouldn't. Uh, it's hard to go someplace where, where um, fiscal need is taken into account, when spending needs, when the age of the population. I would love to see a way to do it without complicating these formulas beyond all measure and setting every province at each other's throats. Um, I, Adding in the way, I'm sorry, adding in the spending needs only encourages more trouble. Provinces can decide what they spend things on and that skews their allotments too. I know it's doable as well, obviously, with um, fiscal capacity, but if you add in spending needs, I think there'll be trouble. But you know, a commission might see a way through that. Some provinces like the Maritimes have hugely aging populations. Uh, what do you do? I, I don't have an answer, but I hope you all find one fast. <laughs> that makes two of us. And I guess maybe I'll quickly transition to something um, that we might need to confront in the short term, and that's tackling reforms to equalization. I'd be curious about Suzanne and Kevin's um, thoughts here as well. So 2020 is the situation where COVID didn't hit every province uniformly. It differentially uh, negatively affected higher income regions relative to low. So the gaps horizontally have shrunk potentially in 2020 to uh, the lowest level that we have ever measured them to be since we started calculating fiscal capacity in this way in 1967. And what this will end up doing is the formula itself is going to want to pay out fewer dollars, but there's a preset number of dollars that will be distributed. And uh, without going into details around how that works, we may very well find ourselves in a situation where next year, every single province is a recipient except BC and Alberta. So including Ontario, because just because of some quirks and the funny ways that the formula is going to respond uh, to the COVID shock. So I think in the short term, there's a need for some reforms and that's some tough intergovernmental 
uh, negotiations. I wonder how we can best approach uh, those debates. So are you asking me if BC would be happy to be in that position? <laughs> I, I will I'd say be curious in your thoughts there. Yeah. I, I will say there's a lot less public debate about equalization here in British Columbia than there are, than I hear coming out of Alberta. Alberta is much noisier about it than we are. But the other issue I would like to address is that uh, in BC, we would be very happy to be more of a revenue generator, but the federal government gets in the way. And uh, we are not, and, and I, this is probably true for Western Canada, but um, we just had the two big LNG proponents in Kitimat walk away from $3 billion worth of expenditures. Uh, Woodbridge left and Chevron left. They had the property, they had the project, they had the permissions, and they walked away. We've got a tanker ban. Um, someone remind me what the tanker ban looks like in the St. Lawrence River, or maybe off New Brunswick. You know, why cannot we ship our products to the to Tidewater? And you know, where was the federal government in, in when Keystone got canceled just now? Like, what did they do to actually get in the way of that decision? We would love to be a more positive revenue generator out here. I don't actually, I personally, speaking for myself now, have never really minded being in a, a, a net giver rather than net recipient. In fact, BC doesn't like, doesn't want to be a recipient of equalization, but it really does annoy me. <laughs> and I think it's wrong that we get stifled from creating revenue here in British Columbia when, when we would like to be creating that revenue. We want those jobs, we want the revenue for here. And if it, some of it goes to other provinces in Canada, so be it. I could just jump in. I think tre Trevor, in answer to your question, um, it, it takes a lot of good faith to have these discussions to, uh, as a, a First Nations leader tells me to, to put your shield down and have a conversation um, without an agenda in place here, just to put some things on the table. But I think Suzanne's point is well taken. It, 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 the, the, the problem here in Western Canada is, I, I think Saskatchewanians are proud people. They're proud of what they produce in agriculture and in the resource sector and our manufacturing sector as well. But the federal government and, and proud to contribute to the federation and keeping the federation together and supporting other provinces that don't have the natural resources that we are blessed with. But at the same time, if the federal government puts handcuffs on the development of those resources or puts implements policies that stifles the ability for these provinces, particularly in Western Canada, to export their market or share with the rest of the country. And I think line five has brought that home in spades with respect to the absolute um, opposite ends of the issue with respect to our federal government when it comes to pipelines, when all of a sudden Ontario and Quebec were threatened with the reduction in, in service because of a pipeline in a jurisdiction outside their control, uh, all of a sudden it, it got front page attention and, and serious attention by the cabinet. So this is the frustration that Western Canadians feel is that, well, <laughs> of course it's important to your provinces of Ontario and Quebec. It's equally as important to the provinces out West. And so I think there has to be some signs of good faith for the federal government, I think Mary alluded to it earlier, to recognize where these stresses are and take some of those stresses off the table so we can have a, a mature adult conversation about these national programs moving forward. You know, one of the things we saw in our Confederation of Tomorrow surveys is this sense of, and to Kevin's point, is the conversation that's gonna to have to happen has gotta be a respectful one. And so where provinces in the West, BC included, are feeling that uh, there is a lack of respect for what provinces are trying to accomplish. Manitoba's always that keystone province of be trying to balance, uh, you know, how we feel in this country, where there's antagonism. You know, the um, people are kind of curious about, Alberta won't be able to change equalization with its referendum. But when we see that there's so little understanding of what equalization is in Canada, when we see that there's such a broad range of issues from equalization to stabilization, to social programs, to just, you know, Jack Mintz talks about the ability to like Quebec has aspirations on the cultural side, which it wants to achieve. The West has economic aspirations that it feels hamstrung on. You know, without that kind of respect, I don't know how we can have these conversations. And 
you know, it's in the Q&A, someone mentioned, you know, really equalization and stabilization, those are coping mechanisms. No federation is perfect, but somehow we have evolved these coping mechanisms. And I think we may be at a crossroads where I'm not sure that the coping mechanisms uh, are enough to maintain that sense of respect and unity across, across the country. Colleen, if, if I could, um, I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, largely we have done federalism by muddling along. We make incremental changes. Um, and, you know, there, there hasn't been something perhaps as significant as the shock of this pandemic um, for a long time that our country has faced, probably not since the end of the world wars is my guess. So is there a better time to rethink our intergovernmental transfer payments? I would say absolutely yes. Um, some of the points that, that Mary and Trevor and, and Kevin and Suzanne raised, I think are really germane, which is having been um, a finance deputy and an intergovernmental deputy simultaneously, I, I kind of had a foot in both, both worlds. But one of the observations I would make is that, you know, th there seems to be growing distrust in Western Canada towards the government of Canada. And yet, um, in other parts of the country, especially amongst equalization recipient provinces, there's a sense that it, the, the rich provinces are out to get our money, so to speak. And so uh, in those negotiations, for example, there, there was always care taken by provinces who were non-recipient to talk about equal per capita funding for other transfer payments. So that, that and, and the view was that the equity portion was dealt with through equalization. And so when, when Mary talked about the history of distrust between rich and poor provinces in Canada, uh, my guess is, I, I'm not around those tables currently, but my guess is that is still a very live issue. And you have that and then you layer on the issues that Kevin raised and that Suzanne talked about with respect to resource development. And so now you have, uh, you have rich, and, rich and less rich in Western Canada against Ottawa, and you have rich versus poor across the country. So it's, it's a bit of a fraught conversation, but if there was ever a time to take things back to the studs, it's probably now. So I think the commission is at the exact right time. The other piece we haven't even touched on uh, in terms of the imbalance is municipalities, um, you know, and, and the fact that they have a growing um, voice, uh, particularly our large urban centers, uh, in the federation and yet are still the responsibility of the provinces to have not much of their own revenue stream outside of property taxes or ability to raise that revenue. Um, but, but that's another factor in this whole mix. And certainly, you know, the gas tax revenue to municipalities has, has been one way for the government of Canada to go around provinces. But, but uh, I, I'm gonna say, and, and I'm, I'm sure in other provinces too, the large urban centers are pushing for more and pushing for this imbalance to also be addressed. So I, I don't know, Mary, if what you what you think or, or Trevor, you think about the role of municipalities in this rebalancing uh, piece, but to me, it, it seems like something that needs to be part of the conversation. Can I just jump in there, Colleen, for a sec? Because I'd like to completely agree with you, Diane. The, the municipalities, the city of Vancouver right now, the homelessness problem has never been worse. The addiction problem has never been worse. In British Columbia, I don't think our numbers have ever been higher with overdose deaths. It's, it's really a dreadful situation. And it does, even though the responsibilities for a number of those things, you know, a lot of those things do not, are not municipal, technically municipal responsibilities. That's where the buck stops, of course, and that's where the problems are felt. So I really echo that concern. I, I agree. I think that uh, there was a conference a couple of weeks ago on fiscal federalism in at the University of Ottawa. And they looked at the notion of putting municipalities 
on a better basis in order to raise revenues. I think, I think you're right, Deborah. This is the perfect time to look at the whole situation overall. I started wondering as we were speaking about the possibility of a royal commission. Usually it's a way to fob issues off, but I wonder if a royal commission given a short term mandate could look at this entire issue of revenue raising in 2020-2021. There has to be, as you point out, a better way to handle it. I mean, every year municipalities are desperate to get their operating budgets into balance. Every year. It, it's a scramble for revenues. There has to be a better way we could use our resources but it requires looking at the overall package of revenues. I mean, I looked at equalization because I see equalization as the foundation stone of a modern federation. Without equalization, we wouldn't have national programs for Medicare, for uh, post-secondary education, for social assistance. It allowed the poorer provinces to participate. But good grief, it's many, many decades later, and it's time to look at the whole system as a whole, and you raise quite properly municipalities as part of that. So thank you, Diane and, and Mary and Suzanne. One of, the, uh, uh, part, one of the attendees is Enid Slack. Enid is a member of the Fiscal Relations Commission, and Enid is, um, that's basically her role in the commission is to raise the issues of municipalities so that we don't miss that opportunity as our group starts to look at these questions. Um, it's, you know, the commission was designed basically to be independent. So not a federal Royal Commission, We've had uh, commissions that have been funded by the Council of the Federation, essentially the provinces. Um, I see Al O'Brien has been sitting in, and if anybody has has the scars of these wars, it would be it would be him. So you know, we know that many good people have asked these questions before us, and many good people will ask them after us. But we think it's a point in time where we need to not just examine. Uh, equalization or stabilization or the other program, uh, social programs, but we really do need to look at the whole ball of wax. And so we will be putting out a series. We've got the two backgrounders already on our website. We've got one in the in the works on uh, tax trans tax point transfers, which is one of those kind of more arcane topics. Uh, and you talk a little bit about it in your book of. At some points in time, the feds have backed off and said, okay, provinces, you can increase your taxes to, to um, fund your responsibilities. Sometimes the provinces do, sometimes they don't. Um, but, you know, we've taken a very broad look at this. And, and so we're not, we're not just looking at this from an economics perspective, because fundamentally, you know, what we've talked about today is there's fundamental political problems at stake here too. You know, if, if, if we could just, you know, if Trevor could just get his economist buddies around the table, I'm sure that we could solve this in, in a relatively short period of time. But there are political considerations and they're very real and they're very important. You know, I think Canadians do think sharing is, is a reasonable thing to do. It's what we do as a country. But we also have to think about other questions like fairness. Um, we, all, we, all, we all are taxpayers. It all comes out of one pocket at the end of the day. And so it's, uh, it's something that we're gonna be working on. We're gonna look at the municipal perspective in that. So you know, keep, keep your eyes and ears open because there'll be more coming from us. If you know anybody who, who has too much money and, and wants to support this, then have them give me a call. We can, we can arrange that. Um, but in the meantime, there's a lot of people doing a lot of good work and I really, really wanna thank our panelists. Um, I learned a lot today. Thank you so much. Thank you for your, your insight. 
your authenticity and your honesty of, of bringing your own experience into this. So thank you very much. We're one minute over time, not too bad. Thanks very much. Thanks all of you. Thank you, Colleen. Thanks, Colleen. Bye thank for you, now. everyone. We'll be back on this topic again. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>